if you ever wanted to see hip hop, look, it's right here. They're gonna respect how I'm moving and then I'm never gonna stop. <laughs> Our voices are the loudest on this planet. Peace is B Mike. I'm dropping an exclusive collab with BET, available only online, inspired by the hip hop awards and the current cultural climate of social engagement and equality. Log on for more information. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I am Joe Claire, and this is I Heart, I Art Hip Hop. You know, I Heart Hip Hop, but this is I Art Hip Hop. This is where we have a discussion, a one hour discussion about the convergence and the meetings of art and hip hop, resistance, culture, everything, all of it. Now, BET and Viacom's consumer products. Um, consumer products division have gotten together their consumer products team have gotten together to get this discussion off because we need to discuss how art is uh, uh ever present how hip-hop is ever present how in all of our societal things in, in our in our culture in our day-to-day -day news our day-to-day -day television and our media in our clothes and in our fashion and everything art plays in hip-hop plays in and we have been here from the start so we have a, a dope dynamic brother out of New Orleans. His name is B Mike. And B Mike is an is an influencer. He's a visual artist. He is uh he is he, I mean he's all of it. And and since we are, you know, sitting at the, the 15th annual BET Hip Hop Awards, it was just time to really make this pop off. It was time to really get this conversation going. It's no, you know, I'm not gonna make any uh uh you know front like we're not sitting in the middle of a pandemic. Like we're not sitting in the middle of an uh, incredible time because of what's going on in our streets, what's going on with our politics and in our nation. So this is the perfect time to have this discussion. We have some some dynamite people to talk to. We're going to kick it off with B-Mike, but y'all don't want to miss any of the speakers we have coming on today. So I, I have a, a thing that they wrote for me to read for my man B-Mike so everybody understands exactly who it is that we're about to talk to. And what it says is B-Mike has used his work to engage in transitional dialogue about the intersection of art and resistance. And his public murals are a reminder that we all have the opportunity and the obligation. We all have the opportunity and the obligation to create bold histories. Right now, everybody, let's get down. Let's get to it and welcome my man B Mike to the to the to the cast. It's not a broadcast. It's just a cast right now. Let's welcome <laughs> my man B Mike. B Mike, what's good? Peace, peace. I'm 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 excited to be here. Me too, man. Pleasure to meet you, brother. I can't wait to you know <laughs> do this COVID free so we can dab each other <laughs> and all that other stuff. Exactly. I'm sending your elbow right, right back at you. Look. <laughs> I love it. So, man, let's get right into it. Um, let's 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 start off with you and how you describe the intersection of art and resistance definitely i mean i think all art is about communication whether you know literature music poetry uh dance visual arts it's all about communicating and i think um a part of our communication has always been a type of resistance you know uh the idea that existence is resistance you know we we oftentimes it, it exist in a way where it's like the fact that we survive the fact that we're still here is a part of our resistance. In any case, we get to, to to showcase that or to to celebrate that is a type of form of resistance. And also in terms of communication, like whatever the people are talking about, we talk about it through our art. And if the people are talking about resistance, we talk about it through our art, we reflect that in our art. And so I feel like that's a huge part of how we contribute to the conversations that's happening in the streets. Let, let me ask you a question. So. Um, one, can you remember the first time you picked up a spray paint can to, to get busy? Yeah, man. So my story is a little bit, I, you know, I, 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 I went to college for filmmaking. So I, I, I thought I was going to be doing that for the rest of my life. I did a bunch of music okay. videos and 
post Katrina New Orleans, doing music videos in New Orleans was a was a process of trying to find these locations that reminded people of what we've been through. That reminded people of the storm and 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 the, the the derelict that the storm had produced. And so I found myself trying to find these locations, and all in these locations were graffiti. It forced me to look at it in a different way. And you know, imitation is the highest form of flattery. So I found myself going back into these forgotten spaces not with my camera, but with a spray can trying to get up as I saw other people doing it. And truthfully, the first like official painting I did, it's kind of surreal and, and, and serendipitous to be sitting on this panel or this conversation. My homie has a tattoo shop or had a tattoo shop. He asked me to do a mural on the wall and I did a portrait of a public enemy and he wanted a clock. So he wanted his clock on the wall. So I had this portrait set up where it was like Chuck D and Flavor Flav with the clock. And that was like my first time using spray paint on an official project that made me feel like, oh, yo, I'm an artist, son. So that was beautiful. I got you. Now, my question is, you know, just a second ago, you mentioned that, you know, our art just pretty much by by default, you know, speaks to resistance. Um, us in this country, all of most of the stuff that comes out of us speaks to resistance. Was that your experience as well? Or were you just trying to make something dope? Nah, man, I, I'm, I'm keenly aware that I come from a legacy of, of creators and artists who understood the power in their words, the power in their craft. You know, Paul Robeson said, artists are the gatekeepers of truth. You know, when you think about that idea and that responsibility, it's, it's no way to yield that weapon unless you do it with responsibility. You know, Nina Simone said it's the artist's duty to reflect the times. And so it's very difficult to, to, to be from underneath that legacy, to stand on the shoulders of those giants and not try to, to at its best, continue that relay race and, and continue on that, that mission. And so um, I found early on that my art was doing something to other people and I wanted to be conscious about what it was doing and how I could be intentional about, you know, if people are gonna listen, let me make sure I have something to say that's of value. Um, and I still, to this day, try to think about that every time I pick up a can, a paintbrush, a pen, whatever it may be. I try to think about that responsibility. That's a that's a big attitude to have, brother. If if I may, I mean, <laughs> you named two giants. We ain't even been on for five minutes. You <laughs> Man, Paul Robinson and and Nina Simone into the conversation. Those are are, are um those are gigantic. Uh, the, the sentiment can be small, but where they come from makes them huge. Definitely. Did you see yourself? Did you see yourself sort of in the, the same lineage as, as those greats? Yeah, I mean, I mean, not not to be like, you know, I, I feel like we all are, are, are descendant or or we're all are, are responsible to that legacy because that legacy we exist because of those sacrifices from the past, because of of learning from example from those great artists that said, you know what, our time on the stage is that much more beneficial when we consider and include the voices of those who aren't on the stage. And so I feel like hip hop has always been such a big part of that legacy because it's been about speaking for those who didn't have the microphone. And you know what I mean? And I feel like I've heard many artists speak words and, 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 and poetry and, 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 and energy that I felt was a direct representation of me, even though I wasn't on the stage with them. And so I feel like it, it behooves us to, 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 to consider that at all times when we when we're blessed with the opportunities to share that we share. You know, Elder told me, he said, when I walk in the room, my race walks with me. And I feel like a part of that is that understanding that, you know what, it's, it's that heavy responsibility and it doesn't have to be heavy, it's a blessing. You know what I mean? It's, it's mm -hmm. a privilege to be able to paint a portrait of a beautiful black person, not because this person is unique in any way from anyone else, just because I'm showcasing who they are in a way that I see them as beautiful. You know what I mean? And I, by default, I'm hoping we all see the same thing. You know, it's like alchemy, this transformation. We, we change the way we see each other as well as the way we see ourselves. And, and that's what I feel like a role of, of visual art in the context of, of hip hop and, and resistance. Oh, this is going to be a dope conversation. This man <laughs> just said alchemy. This man. <laughs> so can you, if, if you could, brother, can you uh, talk to or uh, speak to the, the, con the, the creative process that mm -hmm. you, you uh, use from, from inception to completion. Right. Uh, and, 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 you know, I know it's hard to, enc to encapsulate that into so quick, but can you encapsulate that into something really quick? Yeah, man. I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's definitely about like uh, the process is like a choreographed dance. You know what I mean? Like for me, okay. I'm definitely at all times trying to amplify black voices and amplify uh, black stories. 
And so it starts off with just like an idea that then translates to me doing a reference photo of some sort, uh, whether it's from a person I know or someone I'm trying to honor, an elder in the community. And then from that reference photo, you know, I play with it on on, on different uh, apps on my iPad or on the computer. And then from there, I kind of uh, create the image on the surface, which for me typically is a large scale surface. Using spray paint kind of forces you to work large. So a typical canvas for me is like 12 feet by 12 feet, if not 50 feet by 50 feet. You know, I got a mural in Times Square that's like 15 stories high. So the the, the canvas is always large, which forces the performance of it to be um that's the capture, that's the moment that's the most special for me. You know what I mean? It's like the choreographed dance, the performance. Um, so yeah, so that's like a little insight of the process. Gotcha. Yeah, it goes from, from choreography to we out here killing, and I got you. Exactly, exactly. I love it. Um, how did this partnership come along with you, you, BET, and the Viacom Consumer Products team? How did that happen? That's a that's this is a big one, and uh, you know a lot of cats gonna be like, "How you get it? I want it." <laughs> Man, this was a long time coming. Truthfully, uh, I was approached a, a couple years ago to do like some uh, some murals in the in the lobby of the Viacom building, um, okay. and and it started the conversation to think about you know how can you know like this collaboration potentially happen in the most organic and tr and true way, um, and it took a couple years for 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 things to be figured out, but as as the climate that we're in and, and thinking about like the, the 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 work that I try to do and 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 linking up with the mission of BET and the mission of, of of this moment, it just was natural to try to figure out how to uh create something in this moment. So I'm I'm honored and, and excited that um that it that it manifested the way it was supposed to and here we are, you know. I want everyone to visit store.bet.com. That's store dot bet dot com to check out uh, B Mike's exclusive collab. We uh, actually have some video of you making the art piece for B for BET. Um, I want to take a look at that right quick, man. That's cool with you. Definitely, definitely. I can talk about what we're seeing right now. So what, what, what we're seeing is like the creation of, of this particular mural that um, that uh, that led that is going to be a part of the, the the pieces that will be available um, on on the online shop. And really, it was just thinking about like the idea of what hip hop has done for us as a voice, as a as as a process of alchemy. You know what I mean? As the idea of like you know, like Jay Z said, the same dude you gave nothing, I made something doing. Or being in the wall as like Juvenile said, you know what it means to turn nothing into something. You know, it's always been this process of alchemy, this process of transformation, this process of turning lemons into lemonade or lead into gold. And so I wanted to kind of honor that with the mural as well as like think about the power that exists in our voices. You know, I mean, just like, you know, life and death is in the power of the tongue. And, and just thinking about how hip hop is such a dope um, exemplar, of, I don't even know how I say the word, a dope example of that. Um, and so that's what I was trying to capture with this piece. Um, and yeah, that's that's like one day of, of time lapse that you see on the screen. Um, just the process getting it in, you know. Use a paper chase, got your block on five. You hear me? <laughs> Look, that's alchemy, son. That's alchemy, like you know, New Orleans. Yes, BG had an album, you know what B it is to make something BG had an album cover Real where he tough. had bullets falling out the sky. It was called Chopper City. And 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 that was, and, and that was at a time when New Orleans was the murder capital of the world. And you could look at that as problematic or you look at that as alchemy. Like this dude turned the pain and the trauma that he was experiencing into art. And that's always, that's been the truth of black people since we've been here, you know what I mean? We've been, you know, singing in the fields to, to jazz, to rock and roll, to hip hop. It's like, we've always found a way to not be defined by the worst of what we're going through somehow transform it into beauty 
and that's a small example of what I hope to accomplish with that painting. Oh, that's the dope, brother. That is that is that is super super dope. Um, let's bring it. We're gonna keep this moving, and we're gonna talk about some fashion and and, and with fashion, hip hop, resistance, and all of this meat. Right about now, I want to bring to the conversation the one and only our day from the DMV representing what's good. What's going on, man? Pleasure to be here. Ple pleasure to have you here, brother. Yeah, um, good, to, good to see you again. Now, now, do I? Did you tell me the name I'm supposed to use? Is it our day? It's our day. It's just our day now. It was fill our it's day. Not. We took the fill off, man. We keeping it short, short and sweet. Got you, got you. Our day meet B Mike. B Mike meet our day. Pleasure, peace, bro. Peace, peace. So, um. Please, brother, tell us about your connection, Ade. Tell us about your connection between art and fashion and how fashion is being used as a message board or has been used, as you saw it, as a message board for hip hop. Uh, well, fashion in and of itself, I feel like fashion is three things. It, it, you're either using it to show your individualism, um, you know, um, to show your status or to show, you know, or to just make a a, a statement mm -hmm. um for me I, i've always used fashion as just to be an individual like um a lot of the uh a lot uh, like a lot of the the brands you see now uh, uh amiri and um uh, and, and prada and all that stuff a lot of rappers they wear them you know to show them as a, a status symbol like even going back to dapper dan mm -hmm. um yeah, the the artists back then they would, they would wear Dapper Dan to show you, yo, we got money, we made it. You know, we you know the the dealers and whoever was getting money back then they would wear Dapper Dan. Um, uh, the people I would say in 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 my era now that are, are using it to be individuals like a young thug, nobody dresses like him. <laughs> Kanye West, nobody dresses like him. Um, and with me, I, I feel like I've towed the line between it. Like, uh, I, I like you know higher fashion brands. But I also like to, you know, wear clothes in my own way, and not well, in the way you normally see them. Well, you know, you I, I understand how you get down. You from the DMV? We have. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. We are all <laughs> you know, about we the struggle. Fashion. We all about the struggle, but we still gotta be fresh. Yeah, for sure. Moschino, Versace. <laughs> These we been for, for decades now. So our day, uh, the Hip Hop Awards coming up. The site for yeah. about to pop off. Yeah. Like that, I don't get no credit for inventing, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> We're going to talk and, about that. <laughs> what I understand, that uh, you you plan on bringing style and substance. Um, yeah. Those that's one of the things I, that I that I that I really dig about um, certain artists is the fact that you can bring style and substance. Like uh, like if y'all excuse me for being a fan for a second, but Lauren Hill, oh my God, yeah, yeah. she was. I, yeah. I, being from the DMV, we love a woman who could dress. And then For sure. The way Lauren Hill would show up on that stage and then she gonna rip this mic means a whole lot to me. Yeah. Um, how do you, how do you, you know, how do you, how does that factor into what you, how you present yourself and what you are presenting like when you're getting into this cypher all day? Uh, I mean, that's the first impression is people see you before they hear you. So, um, I always want to present myself as best as I can. My style has always been more laid back, uh, not really so like pressed for like big names or whatever, but but good design. And um, what I did, I, I got with a stylist. Uh, her name's Taisha. Right. And um, basically, what what I what the stylist does for me is I feel like whatever my vibe is, whatever I like to wear, she'll find pieces that enhance that. And, and gotcha. you know, find the colors and, and all that sort of thing to, to make it pop. And I think when people see the cipher, they'll they'll get what I'm saying. And then if y'all have to excuse me for 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 laughing a little bit, because here in, the, in DC and the DMV, we don't be pressed for nobody. We don't yeah. be, nah, never. We don't be pressed. <laughs> yeah, you just got to know that I got on Gucci. I ain't about to put on the Gucci. You just got to know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You I just got to know. Go off, then we, <laughs> then then as soon as you say something that. funky about it, I'll be like, but hold up, though. You see my tag. <laughs> yeah. Man, it's $700, this T-shirt, man. 
<laughs> but, but nah, you know, um, it, it's always important to me to make a good first impression. Uh, with the with the, I love jackets. I think a, right. a, a, a nice jacket, even when I when I'm on performing on stage, a nice jacket to me is like a cape. Cause when you get on stage, that's like you, you're getting into superhero mode. That's like stepping out of the uh, Superman stepping out of the booth. Right. So it's like a nice jacket. So you're gonna see one of those, and you know the verse is pretty good too. So well, let me ask you this, <laughs> B Mike. Um, listening to this, how does that uh, affect? I, I know as an artist, you probably always your your mind's always going. Listening to what he's saying, does that um? Make you say, well, look, wait till I get back to the drawing board. <laughs> Don't together for all day. Watch this. No, nah, I mean, it's there's so much overlap between, you know, visual arts and fashion. And it's just like, I, I, you know, trying to think about, like, I remember when I used to go in stores and see, like, there was the, the wave of, like, people who would, like, sell, they were selling, like, high end fashion, was doing, like, the drips on the paint, on the clothes and the shoes. And mm -hmm. I'm like, man, I got a whole closet full of that. Like, can I sell that? But real talk, so many of my peers who, who are black visual artists, they started off painting on T-shirts. And I remember when I was in college, my hustle was painting on T-shirts. Like, I was slinging T-shirts for people. Like, people would make requests. They're like, yo, I need my homie on a T-shirt. Or I need this on a T-shirt. And I was sitting there hand painting on T-shirts. So it's such an overlap. Like you said, like, people see you before they hear you. So there's mm -hmm. such an overlap on how you curate your style, how you curate your look. You know what I mean? And that's no different from what I do on a canvas. Art and fashion is almost parallel. Definitely, definitely. And the way hip hop has like dominated both of the spaces in terms of just like the way we kind of govern what is and isn't uh, cool. You know what I mean? I think it's always such a, a thing that as a community, we don't often get as much credit as we deserve for because we, we're, we're the arbiters of what, what needs to stay in the closet and what needs to go out on the streets and, and flex with, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's yeah. hip hop has taught us all that, you know what I mean? Yeah. In New Orleans, we had a uniform in New Orleans. It was T's, bows, and Reeds. Uh, uh, D will talk about that later. Oh, but, like, we had, it was T-shirt, Reeboks, and, and Jabot jeans. That was our uniform, you know? Hip hop taught us that. I think, I think every major city has their own, like, you know, when whenever I, I, I don't have anything to wear, this is what we're gonna do. And, right. You know, in the DC area, New Balance, maybe some, I don't know, like some diesel jeans or something, Hugo Ball shirt. <laughs> yeah. Some, you know what I'm saying? With the, right. <laughs> the, uh, what oh, you call it? The, uh, <laughs> the little skull cap, North Face, <laughs> North Face down, Nike boots used to be, you know what I'm saying? Back when yep, Nike yep. boots. Yeah, every city. Is, I feel this like, is, this is how a you blueprint. know your, your your city's uniform because you'll see it either at the bus stop or in a in a in a pro, inappropriate place. You have brunch, <laughs> bro. Why are you at brunch <laughs> <laughs> with the same thing you had on on the strip? Cause yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I want. Yeah, I got my grandmother and my mother with me. So what? <laughs> <laughs> that's default, man. That's the default right. thing. You know what I call it? Exactly, man. Um, we are going to keep this keep this conversation pushing and and moving on. We have another person to bring into the conversation. Let's interview, introduce D one. D one, where you at? D one, where you at? What it do, my brother? I'm uh, I'm in Atlanta right now. I'm New Orleans on, but I'm in ATL right now. I had to wow. for, for some NAACP awards last night. Mm. So so let's talk about the the you got the power of influence award, correct? Hold on. Flex on them deep. I sure did. I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> but I had I had to pull it on yeah. camera. I, got, I received the uh, NAACP Power of Influence Award last night, man. So I got in the game to be a rapper. Little did I know the path God had for me. I, I wouldn't win a Grammy first. I win the NAACP Award first. So I'm I'm cool with it. Yeah. You know I mean? I'm giving I'm giving you them throwing the fist up for you, my brother. So um, first, first and foremost, congratulations. Way to go. I have no NAACP nothing. I can send them a check. So <laughs> congratulations. Congratulations. Why is it, uh, why is it let, let's speak about your verses, man. And you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, a, a diehard um, lyricist and, and person who looks for what the artist is about, you know, why is it important for you to be intentional in what you say? It's important, it's important for me to be intentional in what I say because 
I was blessed that before I got into the rap game as an artist, I was a teacher, bro. I was a middle school math teacher. Um, and, okay. Yeah, back in Louisiana. So every day I'm face to face with the youth, with our future. And I'm seeing how much they look up to their favorite hip hop artists. I saw one of my students get a tattoo that said M.O.B. on his arm. And when I asked him why he got that tattoo and didn't he know what it stood for, he really didn't know what it meant. But he got that tattoo because his favorite rapper at the time, Lil Wayne, had M.O.B. tatted on his skin. And it's moments like this that I can't erase from my memory. I'm like, hip hop is really influencing the youth. I think about myself, you know, wearing soldier rags to be like juvenile or speaking a certain way or walking and talking a certain way because of what my favorite rapper Nas did. So I thought about mm. it and I said, once I enter the game as an artist, I have that same power in my words to either speak life or death through my through my song lyrics. And um, that's been, you know, that's been on my mind. I never wanted to say, well, I'm just going to give the people what they want until mm. I get to a certain level, then I give them what they need. Because we don't know how much time we have left on this earth, man. Um, you know, my best mm. friend got murdered and that really shook me up. That was at the beginning of my rap career. And that let me know that I needed to treat each microphone and each platform like it could be my last, you know? And I really take that to heart. Mm. Mm. You know, there was, <laughs> I, I sat down some years ago and interviewed some artists by the name of Tupac Shakur and Notorious B.I.G. who said the exact same things, man. So I think you on a, I think you on a good path, young brother. That mean a lot to me, bro. That's, that's, that's powerful. Uh, Master P, let's talk about your fellow New Orleans artist, Master P. He is receiving the I Am Hip Hop Award at the BET Hip Hop Awards. Can you, um, one, speak to, from where you sit, uh, a, a kid from New Orleans, from where you sit, what does Master P mean to hip hop? And then what does he mean to the city of New Orleans? My goodness, where do I start, man? <laughs> I know, I, I honestly, bro, uh, I have a great relationship, a personal relationship with Master P, and he has never been shy about giving up game to help empower people moving forward. And, you know, as far as what Master P means to hip hop, he represents the possibility of what can happen when you truly feel like there's no limit to what this world can define as your success. And Master P, Master P is 100% the example of believing in himself before other people will stamp or co-sign him. So I understand that the power of branding is something also that, uh, that I see from Master P. Master P say you're nothing without a product at the end of the day. So whatever you represent, it should be more than just lyrics that you say in a song. It should be a lifestyle. So my motto is three is up. So whenever I throw these three fingers up, Anybody that's a D1 fan, they already know what this means. Be real, be right, be relevant. But it's one thing for it to be three fingers. It's another thing for it to be a product on a hoodie. You know what I'm saying? And and to be on a T-shirt. I learned this from Master P before anybody else because Master P is going to be in the interview, you know, pulling out his tennis shoes, pulling out <laughs> the, the ramen noodles, you heard me, that he had. The, the rice, the pancakes, the rice, <laughs> he gonna the be cereal. <laughs> And, and he and he got probably a new mixtape that he that he promoting at the time, right? <laughs> right. And, and, and and watch this, and people laugh, but the only people that keep laughing are the ones who don't realize how ingenious that is. Because at the end of the day, P is knocking out multiple birds with one stone. It's like, what's the purpose of having the platform and having the uh, the the attention if you don't have any product? So I respect Master P to the fullest for that. What does he mean to the city? As far as what Master P means to New Orleans, like Master P represents what every black man has gone through at some point in their life. Master P did it all. So the city <laughs> of New Orleans, all the people who came up in the streets and who grew up hustling because you know they 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 had they had a tough life and and they didn't have any other route. Master P could relate to them because he was in the streets. To the people who were hoopers in New Orleans. Master P played right there at Warren Easton High School, you know what I mean? Then went on to play college ball. So Hoopers could relate to Master P. To all of the mom and pop stores, I go to Peaches, Peaches Records, uh, world famous record store, you know, down here in New Orleans. And 
when I'm giving them my CDs on consignment early in my career, they were like, oh, you got that Master P hustle in you. You got that Master P hustle. <laughs> so Master P has touched so many people along the way uh, in his journey, even in New Orleans. I look at old, like, you know, we watching Joe Claire on Rap City as kids, but I'm thinking about Juggy and Wild Wayne on Fat Fat and all that. That's our version of Rap City in New Orleans. And Master P had these brothers, they were the host of the show. But well, Master P had them wearing no limit tanks around their neck. So yep. you, know, you branding that hard in the city of New Orleans that the, the hosts of the show are rocking your chains. It's just it's it's mind blowing, bro. So um so Master P means a lot to New Orleans because I honestly feel like I'm an evolution of what Master P started. I'm a person who I'm from the other side of town. You heard me? I'm from downtown. Mm -hmm. They're from uptown. Mm -hmm. I'm um okay. I'm a brother who I never sold dope a day in my life. I went to college and graduated. I became a teacher. You know what I mean? I didn't play in the NBA. I played in high school. But gotcha. although we may be different in different ways, I feel like I'm the evolution because Master P made it made it okay for me to be comfortable embracing my own story. And that's what Master P did. He embraced his story and he took it to to the moon. And that's what I'm trying to do. Man, I I, I love it. I I I. I for, for all of you brothers who are sitting here, you know, um, being able to remember, being able to, for me, being able to remember when um, there weren't hip hop records on the radio or on the airways or, you know, it, it, did, it wasn't a thing, you know, watching it um, actually become mm. hip hop. I'm that old. I'm old enough to remember before we had rap records, right? Then yeah. watching it, uh, being able to be, like you said, we was watching Joe Clay on Rap City. For me to actually be who that was for you guys however many years ago is mind-blowing to me every day. But to sit here now, um, to to be able to, to speak to you guys and for you guys to give it back to me um, sort of exactly as we wanted it to play out hmm. is I got to let y'all know this is real, real dope, man. This is like to see a, a guy who said, look, I was a math teacher. And now, <laughs> yeah. and now I'm out here getting it. You know what I mean? Is this is this is this is this is uh 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 this is incredible, man. I want you guys to know that from an old guy. <laughs> yeah. Just Isn't receive it? that. Just just take that in for a second. <laughs> I appreciate just, that. Just receive. That wasn't a question or nothing. You ain't even got comment. It was just me giving y'all that right quick yeah. right? while we sit here at the 15th anniversary of the BET Hip Hop Awards. How is uh for 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 D1? How is um hip hop a, a lens on black and brown folks' lives in America? We are the owners, my brother. So of course. <laughs> This is our art form. This is 100% ours. So as far as it being a lens, it's as much or as little of a reflection on the black and brown experience in America as we want it to be because we own it. So it's, it's beautiful for me to see that, honestly, we're seeing that we're not a monolith. So the black and brown experience, while it's similar in a lot of ways, it's also very, very, very unique to different uh, parts of the country. And I think that that's why we need representation from New Orleans, from Atlanta, from Oakland, you heard me, from New York City, from D.C. We need all of this representation because it's all reflective of someone's experience. And I think the best part about, uh, about the current era of hip hop that, that we're in and that I'm able to be in as an artist right now is that we don't feel like we need just one artist to represent our entire city. Even within one city, there are different neighborhoods and there are different people who black and brown people have different experiences. Some went to private school, some went to public school, some grew up on food mm -hmm. stamps, some grew up middle class. These are things that need to be spoken about in hip hop. And I think that we're doing a great job of that to where right now, whatever you want to hear, from a hip hop perspective as a fan, trust me, it's in the marketplace. If you go out and you search for exactly what you would like to hear, there are artists who are speaking about something that is reflective of what you would like to hear. And some, some people like to hear their reality in the hip hop music that they consume. They like to hear something that's relatable. And other people, 
oftentimes people who are outside of our culture, it seems as if they like to hear more of like a more of like a fairy tale, more of like um, you know, like like something that's that's really just uh, almost like a movie, you know. And mm -hmm. honestly, that exists as well in hip hop. So there's a lot of everything. And you know, uh, at one time in my career, I was curious as to how how I could coexist with people who may be glorifying a message that is drastically different from mine. And at this point, I realized that it's not my job to tell someone what to do with their platform, but mm -hmm. first and foremost, it's my job to reflect what I would like to see being done in hip hop. And that's mm -hmm. all I try to do at this point. And through building authentic relationships with other artists and through being a veteran in this industry, you get the respect that comes along with people seeing that you're successful. And along with that respect and with that love being at the core, I've been able to have some conversations with artists that I never dreamed I'd be able to have because, you know, artists don't open up a lot of times because they feel like they have to be Superman or Superwoman in front of their fan bases. But, you know, I've been able to have some real transparent dialogue with other artists. And that's one of the best parts about the black and brown experiences. We coming from, we coming from a place where we can relate, but also to where, you have unique perspectives and, and that needs to be accounted for. I have to bring our next brother in to the conversation and speaking of going left, speaking of doing your own, speaking of being not the norm, it is a great honor to, to introduce this brother to the conversation because I had never seen, by, when I discovered this cat right here, I had never in my life seen anything like this. I had never heard anyone like him to this day, he cannot be duplicated, replicated, or anything else. Please welcome the co-founder of the hardest rap group ever. <laughs> Y'all give it up for Mr. Chuck D. The one and only yeah. Chuck D. Nah, it's, it, it's an honor to be here with y'all, man. And it's also an honor to see Joe is the OG here. And I'm, I'm saying, every time I look at Joe, it's that 21-year-old that, that young man that <laughs> Yeah, I was happy to be around, <laughs> be around. but um, I'm an honored. Thanks, thanks for bringing me into the 21st century, y'all. And I come from a product of listening more than talking, but people know me as a person that talks, but my person is as listening, and I'm a result of 500,000 conversations. But my also, I'm publicly known as somebody that talks because if I'm asked a question, I knew I had to represent a lot of people that thought, looked, felt like me, um, people who, who birthed me, people that came after me. So as that, as that spokesperson, since we use the word platforms a lot, we knew back in the day, Joe, especially that whatever platform we had, whether it was a record to a television set to a radio station, whatever that platform, it wasn't an individual thing. It was speaking for many because you never spoke for yourself. And that's what we came up out of. You've done it so well. So many people uh, have come out of out of your whole advice, counseling, entertainment. You found a way to thread all these things together as you do as a person multi-talented, as we know we have to be, even if we want to talk about the last president or really the real last president, how many things that he had to weave into the narrative of just his job? He could be funny. He could sing a note. He could drop an authentic, you know, bar of, of, of social politics without meandering all over the place. Boom. That, that, and especially seeing, you know, Ade, seeing, you know, B. Mike with his illustration and, and his prowess and his words for describing that. And of course, you know, D1, we played together down in this fine city of New Orleans, you know, and and just to be a part of this circle, I'm just sitting back enjoying listening. And that's pretty much the process because I'm a result of listening and watching more than I'm talking. But like, that's what we had intended early on back in the day. Like you said, Joe, you didn't have no idea that boom, out of you, so many people be watching you and then all of a sudden they control the narrative and they right. run with the man. But then people are coming up out of out of B Mike and, and DI and I they they already see younger people coming up under them like, yo, you inspire me, dog. I'm gonna take man, oh yeah, how can I actually 
follow the first steps that you took. Give me some advice. And that's what it's all about, man. And that is a movement, man. Now, uh, when they talk about Black Lives Matter, it's a clear uh, uh, explanation, man. Black Lives Matter is beyond an organization. It's a movement. Movement. You know, when, when, when D1 got his NAACP award, it ain't for somebody outside to say, oh, what does that mean? That's up for them to use these gadgets, look it up and see how prodigious that organization is. NAACP is benign as somebody would think. That's Black Lives Matter. Urban League was Black Lives Matter in their time because they was dealing up against a gravity that said our lives didn't matter. So right. anytime you answer a situation that basically, even if it's this, this, this current POTUS that's out there now who considers our lives to not matter, everything is a movement of, of, of Black Lives Matter. And you know what? Live means living and the arts is what carry the life, even if the physical go. That's why when Young Energy went to towns and went to local situations, and they said, we're going to take this derogatory statue down, why do you think that president threw out 10-year bids? Because he knew that that art and imagery was representing their narrative, which was derogatory, when we start recognizing, like, Oh, we recognize that this statue is derogatory. Yeah, it's a piece of art, but it's a little bit more than that. Same thing with a Nazi swastika. That's a piece of art, but it's a little bit more than that. It really started off kind of like, kind of like homogenous and fertile, but then it was corrupted. Like many things have been corrupted, whether it's the, 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 the book of a religion you might read, the history you might get, you know, the symbols you might see. And the, the scary thing in the digital age is that it's not like a solid piece of art or, or, or something that stays that's just that's tangible. They can make it disappear. So the fact that art, if the people disappear, the art lives on. And that's a problem to the powers that be. But thanks a lot, Joe. And thank and I really is honor I'm honored being on this uh panel and not just on the panel for for the brothers speaking their prowess, but also those behind the scenes. You know, Charles, Tammy, uh, and a sister, um, well, uh, yeah, uh, Deja. So, well, yeah. Well, Chuck, I, I have to say this. Um, I know, you know, I, I already know your rhymes back and forth. And I went from partying to your records to listening to your word to taking in what you were actually saying to you and I actually sitting on news programs together and things of that nature. And then I popped up and watched you become a champion for for music in the schools and art in the schools. And it didn't, it didn't resonate, it didn't, it didn't dawn on me until I, I saw you do that, how um important that statement you just made really was and how you were the personification of it. I didn't uh, know, I, I, I swear I thought it was oh, he's just a rapper, you know, that I love. Oh, he's a prophet. Oh, but but the word artist, Chuck, I didn't I didn't prescribe to you until I started seeing you fight for the arts. Art is short for artificial. It's real, but it ain't real. It's a facsimile of real life. It's a carry on, even if the physicality is gone. Art is artificial, but the fact is, it's the facsimile. We real. Art comes out of us. You know, uh, art and culture. Is the thing that threads the world together, our human spirit together, and knocks aside all the differences. This is why so many other people come to our art. It brings them together. There's not a tangible reason why they're attracted to our art. One thing that you could probably talk about in this country, since you know we are we are the world, but slavery has something to do with that. And if uh, uh, big up to to Janelle Monet on her latest film Antebellum, mm -hmm. where it spoke loudly to like when the fields was happening, we couldn't say anything directly to that. So we had coda. We had to express ourselves in all kinds of other ways. They showed the scene in there when somebody's like, I'm gonna break this cracker's face, you know? But the truth was that wasn't said and it came out in the arts in an artistic way. It might've came in and like, I'm gonna do a, uh, this, this, I'm gonna pick this car with a little bit of attitude or whatever, and I'm gonna hum to it, and everybody gonna hum with me. 
and I'm gonna put a little bit more muscle in it with a little bit of this going on. And it's not gonna be tangibly visible, but what came out of it was Coda. And this is why we're so attracted to having music and art and culture around us because we were silenced. And if you're silenced in the, in the artic, typical way of, all right, y'all shut up and don't say a word, we're gonna come at you. Came out all kinds of different ways. And, mm. and that art stands. Even if the mm. people disappear, their art, the art stands and the art matters, man, because the lives are woven in it. And so, I mean, when you put up a piece of art, it, that's noise, man. Our skin is noise. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It got to say a word. So my thing, even with rhyming back in the day, it was like trying to take something like from my pops. My pops would untwist me in three words, man. He didn't meander all over the place. Everybody got an old uncle. It seemed like they could knock it down in five words. Make and we know, gen right? The generations will change a little bit, but what OGs pick up how to get to the point without meandering all over the place. Because one thing OGs don't have, like youth energy has, is time. So you got to treat time quite differently. You got to dance with time. You got to treasure time. You got to share time with those that know the value of time. But young energy doesn't have to know that because young energy is on the move. That's why I feel that we're in a society that that old energy got a guide. They could direct. Should they lead? No. Young energy leads, but they should be taught and, and, and bred to lead at earlier age instead of trying to just be consumers. Mm. And, and, and the digital age, as we go on from citizens into netizens like overnight conspiracy conspiracy theory or not whatever the reality is that we went from citizens to netizens the crazy thing about it great friend of mine another great artist prince he said chuck man and he told me this in 1999 joe he said look we got to learn how to manage these gadgets or they'll master us everything is going to be woven through these things we know this and 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 right now in 2020 the goal is to try to tell as many of us as we weave our lives through it how to treat this more like a tool than it is a yeah. toy. Artists figure it out. Artists can say, this is a wonderful tool. The average person is programmed to actually consume from it. So you try to tell them, like, of course, if you, grew, if you was born in 2005, when you get one of these in 2007 or 8, it's going to be a toy. You're a child. The bottom line, the, 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 the trick comes when they turn 20, 21, 22. How do I use this more than it's using me? So it all, it, the, the arts, are, this is liberating for artists as a tool. If for me, I could do something and artistically or graphically, because that's my background, my, my, my degree and my, my hood license as well, you know, and instead of, I'm sending something 3,000 miles away. So instead of waiting for Federal Express, and then somebody giving me a response over a phone, I could pop, 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 boom, it cuts my time down. It makes me not only cut the time down to what I'm trying to do, but it allows me to teach with the time that I have. It allows me to cherish the time that I have. But you got to be taught these things. I'm pretty sure, you know, I, I have a, a radio internetwork. I take pride in being a curator. I played much of D1's music. Every time D1 come up with it, I would say, look, man, we're going to go on and I got to play it, man. That's my honor. But it's the thing that I happen to be in. So when you're actually able to teach the thing that you happen to be in, you make people do their things a lot freely because they know this is a cycle that goes around. And the sports yeah. world, the sports world has figured it out uh, a lot better than us. But the arts world with these devices and gadgets are coming closer to see you know, might be a D1 come from the same city and they have the same cycle of sensibilities and they trade off of each other. Even if they didn't even knew each other, it already is just like you just see this thing going on and they say, this is going forward. And then past is present, present is future, no matter what. Everything started from New Orleans. Everything. I mean, as far as us in this, in this United States of America, 48 miles square, 2,000 by 3,000 mile box because Congo Square was the place that they could not keep all the coda silenced and it went up the river and when you study migration you study the arts because wherever the migration went the arts followed and the arts even led because if you're on a barge going to St. Louis from New Orleans 
you know, some got to take that trip, make that trip something worthwhile or whatever. You want a barge going to get dropped off in Missouri. So Coda, Coda is always going on. And music today is sight, sound, story, and style. Now, story could be, you know, people say substance, but substance could be like whatever, man. You talk about squashing a roach on your on your porch. I mean, that's some substance. It's a story. You, I, I get it. I said it. So there shouldn't be no moral obligation for somebody to do outside what they do. I tell many people when the pandemic came along, they were like, oh, man, I'm paralyzed. I don't know if I should do my thing because I don't know how people are going to take this because I, I, I'm about having this party and who riding, man. I said, well, you should make party and who riding music right now. I mean, you should do what you feel. And if you feel that you should say something more, learn about something more and then say it. Don't let anything stop your arts. Arts are in everybody. The difference is that everybody can't get the arts out of them. And this is ah. where schools come in. Yeah, everybody, arts is in everybody, but everybody can't get the arts out of them. That's why they flock, they flock to the arts. They flock to the arts because it's a reminder, it's a core, it's a umbilical cord back into the birth and the pregnancy of creativity. And that's the beautiful thing, man, when you nurture that. Look, it's one reason they took the arts out, especially when I was in high school in the 70s, man, they took the arts out of the school systems. We knew that all you got to do is study records and films and, you, and art, illustration. You get black history by default. You get it by default. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. That's the. I'm not going to say it was a conspiracy or why they took it out. They basically took it out because of budget. But I'm saying like this. If you have the arts program evaporated in every single school setting and curriculum, but still they want to invest to the football team and the, and the basketball team, you got a one-sided problem. You got a one-sided problem. Because the arts is in everybody, man. Listen, everybody. Uh, I, I, I wish we could sit here and do this forever but we are getting to uh the end of our hour so in in um in the spirit of letting everyone sort of sum up this this hour i have one last question that each guy you know take take 30 40 seconds and 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 sum this up in your closing remarks each of you tell us how hip-hop still has something to say i i think as long as the people are existing thriving resisting uh the conduit of our voice, in my opinion, that speaks most loudly is through hip hop. And I feel like our existence is resistance. And as long as we exist, then we're going to use that microphone to express why we here and why we always will be here and why we survive. I think I, I, there's a painting in the studio in my space here in New Orleans. And on the painting is a, is a portrait of a person. And on her shirt, it says, still here. Because when you really think, like what Chuck D was just saying about like how New Orleans from Congo Square to the world, when you really think about all we've been through and the fact that we're still here, there's so much like that should give you goosebumps in the idea of, of our purpose, of our destiny, of the fact that we through all of that, we're still here. And I feel like you can't silence us. We're not going nowhere. So hip hop is always going to have something to say because we're still here. Gotcha. Ade? Every, every generation has something different to say or, or convey. And fashion, art, and music are that's like that's those are all forms of communication so that's that's something that's never gonna change or leave is people speaking through through hip-hop culture speaking through fashion and speaking through art and especially through lyrics that's gonna be here forever so hip-hop is a forever thing and it's always changing it's always evolving and the stories are always changing and always evolving it'll be here forever d Hip hop is allowing a lot of people to find their purpose in life through being consumers and through being creators of hip hop. So hip hop still has something to say because as long as this world exists, we have discovered, we have created, not discovered, we have actually created an art form that is allowing people to literally connect with the reason why God put them on this earth. And that is powerful in and of itself. So we will, we will never have a day where hip hop is not needed because obviously just having normal conversations with people wasn't enough that's why hip-hop had to be born in the first place so now that it's born it's going to continue to have to live and once again since it was created from black voices i think it needs to continue to be amplifying all of the different types of black voices that there will continue to be as this world moves forward 
So hip hop still got still got something to say for sure. Chuck, let's not give hip hop the term the end all be all. It's it. We've always been hip hop. That's just a term that got applied in the early 1970s, rising out of ashes. But we've been hip hop forever. It it might turn into something else. You know what I'm saying? Hip hop right. is the term of black creativity spawning, especially if you're being silenced. We've always done that. Congo hit the square was hip hop. Whatever happens a hundred years from now, we still gonna be a creative fireball of energy, regardless of anything. Rap music is rap on top of music. So music have already been defined already. So let's not say hip hop's the end all be all because it's not a commodification where you can just go out and buy like you can go you can't go out and own soul. You know what I'm saying? You can't go out and, and, and own hip hop. You, you call yourself a hip hop company. Yeah, we're a, a, a company that exudes soul and stuff like that. Uh, it, it is our creativity. And, th- and let's say the future of hip hop becomes clearer when when at least women become 60% of the narrative. 60%. I, and the reason I say that, that <laughs> I say this right, to say that testosterone, like cocaine, is an ugly drug. <laughs> <laughs> you you, you got to you got to handle it like nitroglycerin, and and often in these situations, testosterone has been so destructive it's obscured everything in its past in its path. So we have to learn how to manage that, and that's embracing the narrative of women creativity inside that that circle. We know we got a voice that screams out loud that needs to be heard, but mm. the the creativity of, of of women in governing and all those other things, man, we already know the society we live in ain't trying to see women come up at all. So we got to look at our testosterone ourselves and say, yeah, this is part of the creative process. I, right, I, right, you know, and uh, that's the future of hip hop. And also, at last, I say this last one: art, culture. It's cultural exchange, man. We all over the world. So we can't box ourselves into the lower 48 and don't think that hip hop or that creativity is everywhere on the planet Earth. You go down to Brazil, if Brazil had the United States quote unquote racial standards, there'd be 90 million black folks in Brazil. Do you not include them in the narrative? They got their own, they speak in Portuguese patois that we'll never understand because Language has been the great divider of people. Governments like to split human beings up and categorize them and put them in boxes or whatever. But art brings them all back together again. So art is a universal language. And when we learn how to support that and encourage that and teach that and ride with it and love it and dance with it and build with it and learn from it and learn with it and teach through it, you know, that automatically will fit society. Well, gentlemen, thank you so very much. Uh, I'm going to go upstairs and get me some estrogen. From uh, <laughs> I, You see the ring on my face. I got some estrogen upstairs. I'm going <laughs> to get into that. I want everybody to make sure they visit the store.bet.com. That's store.bet.com to check out this dope collab between my brother B. Mike and B.E.T. And there's other apparel there that you do not want to be without. Next time y'all see me, I'm going to be rocking it. I'm going to be super, super fresh. You understand what I mean? We know what's coming up. Reclaim your vote. November the 3rd. November the 3rd is election day. Make sure your voice is heard and your vote is is counted. Vote, 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 vote. I don't care who you vote for, but vote. And make sure you take care of all that other stuff on the ballot that's under there too. All them initiatives Mm -hmm. and everything else. And then make sure you tune into the BET 2020 BET Hip Hop Awards. We're celebrating the fact that hip hop has and always will have something to say. Man, thank you all so very much, man. I'm giving you guys all a round of applause. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, thank you for being here this evening, man. This thank is you. super, super dope. I hope we get to do it again. And for everybody tuning in from the from the den, we're not in the basement no more. We in the den. Ah. <laughs> I'm so clear. If you ever wanted to see hip hop, look, it's right here. They're going to respect how I'm moving and then I'm never going to stop.
She like the way I do. Our voices are the loudest on this planet. Peace is B Mike. I'm dropping an exclusive collab with BET, available only online. Inspired by the hip hop awards and the current cultural climate of social engagement inequality. Log on for more information.